everyone, and welcome back to my podcast, which is Fiber, Floss, and Fiction. I am Anne P., and today is Sunday, the 8th of September, 2019. I hope everybody's doing really well. We are still locked here in summer, I think, in the mountains. Uh, it's normally not still in the 90s here, but it has been hot, and... I'm just, I'm ready for the weather to break and for fall to start. Um, I'm not a huge summer person. I know I've said that a hundred times, but this time of year when it's so close to fall, I really, really want it to be fall <laughs> right now. Um, so things here are good. My husband's been home for about a week. He is on his last month of his uh, change of station for work. So he will be back. Uh, home permanently in early October, which we're both really looking forward to. But he came home and was here for 10 days and goes back to DC tomorrow for kind of the last three weeks or so. Uh, so got lots of stuff to talk about. I've been busy with all kinds of things. So I think we're going to just jump right on in there and get going, trying to find my pen, which end is writable. Uh, so I can do some timestamps for y'all. Um, this is a podcast that in contains information about my knitting, uh, spinning, reading, and cross-stitching. You can find me on the web if you are new to my podcast uh, under Wooly Wonka Fibers for my knitting uh, end of the world and under Little Bird Stitcher, all one word, on Instagram and Facebook for my cross-stitch things. So let's go ahead and let's get started with knitting. I have a bunch of things that I've been working on which I can actually share with you. Uh, let's talk about the first thing that I'm knitting because I have a photo up on my phone and wanted to show you that. This is um, a replacement project. You guys may have remembered if you watched my last video that I was planning on casting on the Glenn Fittich cabled cardigan, which I did. And I'm not really going to get into a lot of the specifics of it, but at least for the size that I was knitting, I had some issues with the short row numbers. I ripped and re-knit three times and then realized that the numbers were wrong. And I have no interest in rewriting someone else's pattern, so I just moved on to something else. And I wasn't super far along, so it wasn't like it was a, not a huge deal. Um, so just FYI, if you decide to knit that one, there's some funky bits with it. So I replaced it with another very similar cardigan. This one is from Hohi Locatelli. It's her grandpa cardigan. Oops, sorry for the glare. And it's the same gauge that I was getting and it's a DK weight and it's cabled. So I'm totally happy to knit one of her patterns. She has a lot of great patterns if you have not run into them before. I'm sure everybody who knits probably has. So this is a kind of interesting construction. You cast on the back with the shoulder seams done as um, provisional cast on. I don't know why I always stumble over that, but at any rate, uh, and then you knit down to where you've got the underarm sleeve shaping happening. So this is the center back. Close up of the cables. This is being knit in Rama Yarns Strikagarn, which is their DK weight 100% superwash wool. It's a great workhorse yarn. It's perfect for cables. I wanted to do something in kind of a heathery brown colorway, which this certainly qualifies for. So you work the pattern down to where you're, you're actually casting on stitches to shape the underarms. And then you go back up and you pick up the shoulder seam. And so now I'll be knitting down this way on this short set of shoulder seam stitches, say that three times fast, and working the front. So that's where I am on this one. So far, it's been a pretty straightforward, uh, very fun knit. The cables aren't super tough to do, um, and I think it's super pretty. So working on that in bits and bobs. And then I'm also working on the Chauncey sweater. 
which is by Isabella Kramer, or is, sorry, Isabel Kramer. Here is the picture of it. Now this is a fingering weight sweater. So it's a little bit lighter. It obviously has the multicolored yoke. I'm doing this in Wooly Wonka Fibers uh, Ayrton Sock, which is the Merino Cashmere Nylon Blend. I wanted to get this so I have the back and front correct. Um, the two colorways I'm using are Forest Primeval, which is the dark green, and then Chimney Sweep, which is a speckle dye for the contrast color. It is a very subtle speckle dye. It's not hugely crazy color, obviously, obviously. And the green is this dark forest green. So I have finished the yoke patterning. The color work is all done. I've divided off for the sleeves. They'll go here. And I'm just working on the plain stockinette body. So it's the mind, it's up to the mindless knitting part. So, um, you know, driving around doing errands with my husband this past week, uh, we've had a lot of nights and last weekend we did a lot of errands and running around. I just knit because you're knitting round and round and round. There's no shaping, there's no anything. It's just making a tube. So I have a ways to go. You can see that's what I have done. And I probably am somewhere between a quarter and a third for the depth of the body. Um, so all of the quote difficult parts are done. I don't, this was not a difficult color work pattern. It was beautifully written. Uh, this is one of the yokes that has the shaping incorporated in it. And if you like yoke type sweaters, uh, just FYI, they announced the classes for Stitches West, I think it was last week. So if for some reason you are not going to go to Stitches Salt Lake or Stitches SoCal, Stitches West, I will also be teaching my yoke fitted sweater class, meaning it's a class talking about top-down yoke sweater construction and how to make the sweater fit you perfectly. So I am teaching that at SoCal as well. And I will put links down below to all of my classes if you have interest. So uh, just working away on that. Like I said, um, kind of at the mindless point. So I'm just doing rounds as I have time to do them. Um, neither of those are deadline knitting. So they're going to get back burnered a little bit because uh, I just received a big box of yarn in the mail from the yarn guys to work up some new patterns and some other samples for Stitches West, which is, I, I know, not till February of 2020, but that is how kind of the schedule works. Um, so I'm excited to be working with that yarn. It's new to me. I've done some swatching with it, but it's an amazing blend. It's alpaca and linen, and it's beautiful, uh, just beautiful. Um, so more on that kind of as we come, come along. Uh, I have one new pattern release to talk about, which I do not have the sample. It has already gone off to be packed up for the guys, uh, so they have it in time for us to get it to Salt Lake. And that is my Willow Shawl. I will insert a link down below if you're interested in that. It is a lace shawl, two skeins of fingering weight. The sample was knit in my Nimue sock, which is the silk superwash merino yarn base and is available as a Ravelry download or you can also order a kit from the yarn guys if you're so inclined. So that is where I am with my knitting stuff. Uh, I'm just going to segue straight into spinning which I do have a little bit of. I have been spinning this gorgeous um, silk and merino top from Three Waters Farm. It's in the colorway, I'm looking over there at the tag, Early Blooming. This was from one of the clubs a couple of years ago. I can't remember if it was two or three, but anyway, uh, lots of nice bright colors. So this is half that's left. There's two ounces left in here. And I have finished spinning the singles on the first half. So spinning this slightly thicker than usual, and I'm hoping to get 
sort of heavy decay to worsted weight and I'm thinking a pair of fun slightly felted mittens might be really gorgeous in this colorway. Um, super bright, super fun. I think they'd be a nice way to add some bright, a little bright pop of color to a cold winter day. So that is where I am on that. Um, again, no particular goal on it, but this will be next on the wheel. So I think that covers us for knitting and yarn things and uh, some fiber stuff. Uh, as always, all of the patterns I talk about, I will endeavor to link below so you can find them if you want more information about them, as well as vendors like Three Waters Farm. Uh, obviously not a pattern involved, but if you're interested in fiber from her. Okay, let's move on to books. I have four books to talk about this week. Um, let's start with the two that I have print copies of, which I got from my library. If you are a member of Magical Stitches in Literature, you know that there is an ultimate reading challenge that's been ongoing since January to use a book title or an author name to spell out Hogwarts, the first letter of Hogwarts, so like H, uh, as well as the four houses. So Slytherin, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, and Gryffindor. And I was kind of down to the end where I had a whole bunch of Fs and then some more difficult letters to try to slot in, like some Ys. Uh, I am very close. I have one book left, which I am, I think, about a third of the way through, if I remember right, to finish up for O, um, the O prompt, one of the O prompts. Uh, so these are all ones that I read to fulfill letters that I needed to fill in, if that makes sense. So the first one is by Kathleen Flynn. It's called The Jane Austen Project. Obviously, got that from my uh, library, where this was a two, or 2017 kind of librarian recommended book. Interesting premise for this one. If you are a Jane Austen fan, you will probably love it just because it features Jane Austen in it. So the premise is, is two humans from a point in the future, um, after the world has sort of had a catastrophic meltdown, uh, but they have figured out how to time travel and they send two humans back in time to try to uh, extend Jane Austen's life and not have her die before she's 40 in the hopes that she will continue to be a creative genius for longer years. So the two people that they send back, one is a woman who happens to be a physician because they wanna to try to figure out what caused Jane Austen to die and uh, her colleague, who is an actor, but is also kind of an Austin scholar, so I mean, he's probably somebody with an English degree because that sounds about right. But at any rate, so they push, they go through a bunch of training to be able to assimilate themselves back into the early 19th century culture of England, and they send these two people back with money and understanding the manners and social mores and things of the time with the backstory that they are a brother and sister who uh, have given up their plantation, the family plantation in Jamaica and have moved to the UK having manumitted all of their slaves on their plantation and they're kind of starting their life over again after their parents have died. That's the story. So the things this author does really well with this story are creating kind of a believable uh, backstory for these two and immersing them into the Regency period, getting them hooked up with Jane Austen and her family. She does a great job kind of recreating Austen and her immediate family, her brother Henry, um, her sister Cassandra, uh, just the sort of things that uh, are a little bit more realistic in terms of time travel, like the main character, the woman, um, they actually talk about things like what it's actually like to be female in the early 19th century and childbearing and all of those things, uh, as well as some tidbits about medical science and kind of where it's starting to go to but hasn't yet. 
Um, the things that I did not like about this book was the fact that time travel is such an amazing and integral part of this story. And she just kind of tosses some bits and pieces in there. Like she hadn't really thought the whole process through. And then when she did talk about it, it was so weirdly technical that yeah, at least for me, even the three or four sentences kind of made my eyes glaze over. I was slightly confused by that part of it. Um, so they wind up um, making contact with Jane and her family and making some progress, if you will, towards understanding maybe why she's sick and looking for the lost manuscripts that supposedly existed. Um, I'm not going to tell you exactly how it ends, but I will say that the two characters who are the time travelers return back to their contemporary time, having sort of wrecked the current um, historical timeline. They've changed enough things that, that the present that they return to is not the present that they left. Uh, so recommended with some reservations. If you like Jane Austen, you'll still probably like this book. And like I said, it was an intriguing concept. There were just some details in it that bothered me a little bit. So um, just be aware that it's maybe not as smooth an effort as it might be. Um, but good. The next book that I tackled is a short one called The Housekeeper and the Professor by the author Yoko Agawa for a Y prompt. Um, basically, I went to the library and I wandered up and down until I found a book with the author name that I could use. This book, I really like this book. It's a very interesting tale about friendship and kind of your swan family, meaning people that you come to think of as family that you weren't born into the family. So the two main characters are the characters of the title. There is a woman who is a single mother. Um, this is set in Japan. Woman who's a single mother. Her son is in third grade, I believe. And she works as a housekeeper and she gets assigned to the professor's house. She's, I believe his ninth housekeeper he is somebody who is in his late 50s, early 60s. He basically lives in a small outbuilding behind his sister-in-law's house. His sister-in-law is a widow. Um, and he was once a brilliant mathematician and was in a car accident that damaged his memory. So everything after, I believe it's 1973, is lost to him after about 90 minutes. So every day when the housekeeper comes to the house, she's basically a brand new person for him. And he spends his days filling out contests that require you to figure out some difficult math problem. He can do that and he remembers his time as a professor teaching math. And he's sort of a sweet, sweet soul. Um, he comes to take the housekeeper under his wing as best he can with his memory deficiencies. And the way that he copes with a lot of the things in his life is he writes himself notes and he pins them to his clothes. So for instance, he has a note that reminds him that she has a son who they call Root for the square root because the top of his head, the way he has his hair cut is kind of flat. Um, so that's his nickname. And the interesting thing about this book is you never learn anybody's real name. You don't learn hers or his or the boys or the sister-in-laws. Um, so you find out about them all just through character development. And it's about the, the growth of their friendship and the fact that he challenges this young woman who doesn't really have very much education to think about math and to think about things in an orderly, progressive sort of way and the fact that mathematics obviously is the great love of his life and all of the amazing things that it's done to sort of keep his mind going and uh, youthful, if you will. 
Um, and he takes a real shine to her son where he becomes kind of almost the foster grandparent or a foster older uncle. Um, there's some backstory in here. Like I said, even though it's a really short book, it's only about 120 pages. Um, this author is a very good writer. So I loved this little book. I thought it was wonderful. I, it's sort of as a hidden gem because like I said, I just picked it for the author name. Um, it has definitely a very sort of Japanese feel to it. Um, things are drawn kind of like what I would consider in black and white calligraphy. Um, the characters are interesting. You learn a little bit of tidbits kind of each chapter as you go through. I completely fell in love with the professor. He reminds me a lot of my grandfather who was a math major. Uh, he was not a mathematician, but he did major in math in college before he went on to med school. And you just love the fact that they create a family for themselves, even though both she and he are people who are kind of on the fringes of, they're not societal outcasts, but you know, he obviously has his memory deficits and she's a single mom working as a cleaner. So maybe not somebody anybody would even take a second look at or take the time to get to know. And they both kind of find each other, which in a way is its own very sweet love story. Um, not any romantic attachment between the two of them, but she grows to love him and he grows to love her and the, and the little boy. So if you can find a copy, I highly recommend that one. That was a, that was a really good read. So the next two books I read are kind of on opposite ends of the spectrum. Let me start with The Night Tiger by Yangtze Chu. Uh, and again, I will put links to all of my Goodreads, to all of the Goodreads pages for the books that I talk about so you can find them if you would like. Again, I picked this one up because of the why in the author's first name. Didn't know anything about it. Got it as an audio, audible audiobook to listen to when I went for my walks and loved it. I'm now going to look up other things by this author. This was a book that was picked for the Re, for Reese Witherspoon's book club, and I tend not to like celebrity book clubs. I feel like books should stand on their own merit and not just because you know Oprah tells me to read them. Not that she doesn't necessarily select good books, but I'm just always a little leery of accepting that recommendation from someone with star power behind their name. I'd much rather have a friend say, hey, I really think you would like this book and then go find it. In the theory that the friend knows what I like to read and probably will get me something good that's a good match for my tastes. So The Night Tiger tells, uh, so it's set in Malaya and there's two threads that run through it, two story threads that run through it that then wind up combining and running together by the end of the book. The book starts off with a young boy who's a houseboy for an English doctor in a small town and the doctor is sick and dying. He's an older gentleman and he's had the small finger on his left hand amputated at some point in the past and he doesn't know where that is but he tells the boy that after he dies the boy must find the finger they he thinks he knows where it is um, but it's sort of like in a couple of towns over maybe this boy has to find the finger and return it to the old man's grave within 40 days or else he will not be a complete soul when he tries to pass over to the afterlife. So he dies in like the first chapter and so this young boy sets off on this pilgrimage to try to find the finger and the old doctor has given him a, a letter of introduction to a younger doctor in this somewhat bigger town over uh, who is the person who performed the amputation originally. The two men ha are both English and they both were interested in the legend of these man-eater tigers who are said to be human for part of the day and then become tigers at night and they always have one deformed paw and uh, the local legend is is that they are actually humans who can't control sort of their baser side and so they become man-eating tigers at night and 
you can always identify their paw prints because they'll have one paw that's slightly damaged. And so the young boy, he's not sure whether the doctor that he had worked with was in fact one of these man tiger beasts. Uh, he's a little bit unsure, but there's been some discussion um, before the old doctor dies that there's been a man-eating tiger on the loose that has a deformed left front foot. The other storyline that's, that's parallel is there's a young woman who is working as a dressmaker's apprentice. She comes from a family where her father died fairly young. Her mother remarries and brings into the marriage a stepson who they are five hours apart. They were born on the same day, the same year, but five hours apart. And the stepfather is abusive, uh, physically abusive to his own son and her mother and sort of mentally abusive to her. And all she dreams about is getting out of the house and doing something with her life. She's very bright, but her father-in-law doesn't, or her stepfather doesn't want to pay for schooling for her. Her stepbrother gets a scholarship and goes off to medical school. So she's working as a dressmaker's apprentice, and she's also working part-time as a dance hall girl to pay off her mother's mahjong debts. And one night, this young man comes into the dance hall who tells her, he's a salesman, and he tells her that he's going to have a string of good luck now because he has a very special charm or talisman in his pocket, um, which he, he winds up losing to the young woman. She finds it on the dance floor, and it turns out to be this shriveled finger. So from there, those two storylines converge, and through a lot of the book, you're not sure how much is sort of native superstition and how much is truth and who's telling the real story. And into this mix comes this concept of five Confucian virtues. She is, her first name is one of them, her stepbrother's First name is one of them. The young boy, whose name is um, Ren, has a twin brother who's predeceased him um, when he was only eight. Yi, who is number four of the Confucian virtues, and then there is a Li. There is a fifth character, and as the book progresses, you're not sure who this fifth character is, but it's some some character who is trying to restore what they think of as order to all of this set of crazy stuff going on, but you're not sure who it is until maybe the last tenth of the book. Lots of great characters, wonderful uh, setting uh, creation. You really understand the world that these people are in, even though I personally don't really know that much about Malay Malaysia and the people who live there. Um, I mean, I knew it had been a British colony uh, or under British rule, I guess I should say. And there's a lot of intermingling of cultural beliefs. So you've got the English, you've got the, the native Aboriginal Malay people, but there's also a lot of Chinese influence in there. So there's some people who speak English and Chinese, there's some people who speak all three languages, there's some people who only speak English, some people who only speak Malaysian, just very interesting and I think heightened, the story was heightened by the fact that the author herself read the book. She is of Chinese descent but grew up in Malaya. And Jessie Marie mentioned this a few of her podcasts ago where she talked about the fact that it's great to have the author read it. And I think even more so in this book because the characters, um, she speaks with a British accent she speaks English with a British accent, but she can slip into Mandarin Chinese and she can slip into Malaysian seamlessly. And I'm not sure that there would have been that many, let's say British uh, readers of the book who could have done that as easily as she did. And she did a great job, I thought, with the presentation of all the characters. So she has another book out called The Ghost Bride that I'm probably gonna pick up because I felt so strongly about what a good book this one was. 
I just I really really enjoyed it uh, and I would give it a high recommendation as well um, it's not a children's book at all uh, there's some unpleasant things that happen to the characters um, I think I would avoid it if I was under maybe 15 or 16 but very well written good plot excellent character and world development and honestly, if you could get the audiobook from your library or on Audible, I would highly recommend the Audible book version of it, audio book version of it. Okay, so that was The Night Tiger by Yang Si Chu. The last book, which I'm not going to spend a ton of time on, is called Under a Blood Red Moon. And the author is Nina Hepson, I think that's correct. So this was a cheap book. It was one of the like 99 cent specials in my book list that I get every morning. And I was like, okay, I need a U. I'm gonna get this one. It sounded like it would be up my alley. There was some steampunk in it. There was some vampires in it. There was some adventure in it. I did not like this book. <laughs> I should have liked this book, but I did not like this book. Uh, very unevenly written. Um, so first off, again, I don't know if this is just a, a trend, a disturbing trend or whatever, but who who is proofreading these books? Who is proofreading these books? Things that sound the same but are spelled different are not the same word. That needs to be cleaned up. I can't believe the editors are missing that. If I'm, as I'm reading through it fairly quickly, I'm catching them. There were several instances of that in this book that drove me nuts. This book is basically, I think the author has read some popular books, has seen some popular movies, and she kind of took plot threads from two or three and put them together. There's the sort of steampunk heroine, but it was very jarring to me because if you're going to set something in the 1880s and 1890s, and you're going to try to immerse your characters in that world, you can't have them speaking as if they are from the 20th century or the 21st century. People didn't talk that way. That bothered me. Um, the characters are all kind of two-dimensional and I realized when I was reading it, all of a sudden I looked up, you know, the bottom corner of your screen if you're reading it on a tablet and it'll tell you how much percentage wise you have left to go. And I realized I was at the 90% mark and I thought she's going to have to tie up all of these bizarre loose ends in 10% left of the book. I don't even see how she's going to do it. Well, she made it really easy because there was like one event in which all of this stuff came together. She killed off some people. One person who you thought was on the wrong side turned out to be a good baddie and was forgiven by everyone else and the vampires were all very nice. I'm not gonna recommend this book, just know it's out there. Under a blood red moon, um, yeah. I finished it because I needed the U and that was the only point of it. Okay, so <laughs> there are our books. Let's talk about stitching. Okay, so I have had a bunch of stuff that I have worked on this week, but I wanted to show you first a finish, a fully finished object. Uh, you might remember this is my uh, Prairie Schoolers When Witches Go Riding. I dyed the fabric, I dyed the yarn, or yarn, sorry, floss, which is silk floss, and got this frame on sale. It's black, but it has a little bit of red in it, which I think picks up the red in the house. It's not quite perfect. There's one little divot right there that I have not been able to sort of get straight, but um, I am really happy with it, and it is out on my... We're not at Halloween yet, but I am so ready for fall. This is out already, uh, so I can enjoy it for the season. I'm really pleased with how that one came out, and I'm enjoying it. Uh, let's see. Let's talk about just what I've been working on. I'm not going to go through Magical Stitches prompts or anything like that. I just want to show you guys what has been happening here. Uh, a stitching shelf. I am 
on this page, which is page six, I believe, of the large format. I have about 600 stitches left to do. I am going to have this page finished this month. I'm going to pull this out to use for a couple of things this week, um, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But anyway, that's where I am on that one. And this right here is about the middle of this whole first row. So I'm at about the halfway point. My goal for this year is to finish this and one more page. And I'm pretty sure I can do that without any problems. So I'm very happy with how that's looking. Working it at cross country, page by page cross country, now that I'm moving along through that. Oops, sorry, that one's not the easiest to show off. Next, I'm going to show you what I've been working on today as well as previously, and that is Village of Hawk Run Hollow. This is on 22 count Hardanger using the DMC conversion. It's a little bit crumpled because it's been on my Q snap this weekend, but I was able to finish block seven this past week, which I think came out great. I opted to use a very pale greeny blue that's in the same family as these colors because these were supposed to be stitched in white and as were the daisies, but the daisies I think show up better because they're on this field of the olivey greens. I didn't think the white was gonna show up here, so I sub subbed in that really pale, kind of pale teal. And I like it, I think it looks good and I think it shows up better. So that's block seven done and I am now working on this center piece, block eight, which is the grist mill. So I put about I put about 600 stitches into that over the weekend, and it'll be out again this week for some one of the homework prompts and keep chipping away at those blocks. I don't want to jinx it, but I have decided that it would be nice if maybe I could finish this, which is kind of family related, um, and those individual prim-ish blocks. If I could finish that this year before I start Anniversaries of the Heart in 2020, because in at least inside my head, they're very similar projects. So not 100% sure I will get that done between now and the end of the year, but you know what? I'm gonna try, gonna give it a go. Put a few stitches into 12 Days, this Jim Shore project. I am also stitching this on a 22 count hard hanger. And I think uh, we just had 200 stitches to do, so I worked on this quilt block, and that was it. But that's where he is. So a little bit of progress, and nothing crazy. You know, didn't set a land speed record to get that one done, but pulled it out. And I don't know why, but this project is one that I never think about pulling and I'm never that jazz to be like, oh yeah, I want to work on that. And then I get it out and I think, I really like working on this and I don't know why I think that then. You would think, I would remember from time to time, hey, I really enjoyed working on that. I should work on that some more. No telling. Anyway, uh, I also worked on my Celtic wheel, which is a Joan Elliott design. This is from Bewitching Cross Stitch. That is what it will look when it's look like when it's done. I am stitching this on a 32 count color and cotton even weave in the colorway sampler gold. And you might remember I have the first page over here completely done. And so I worked up here in that upper border of page two. There are four pages in the pattern. Love it. Love working on this one. Um, I was originally gonna focus on this for a finish for this year, but I've decided since it's a newer project that I would really like to get Hawk Run Hollow done before this one as a sort of focus finish piece 
um, which is fine. I pull this one out when I can, when I need to use it for a prompt. It's all good, right? I mean, everything's getting worked on. Next, I worked on Summer Schoolhouse 1, which is this pattern from Brenda Gervais. I'm converting all the colors, which are gentle arts of some kind, and stitching it one over one on a 32 count Monaco. And here is my current progress. I got a lot done on the house. And really enjoy working on this one. If I have an excuse to pull it out for other things, I may go ahead and do that. Love how that um, color and cotton threads for this. So really love. This is dark dune, I think, or dark sand dune. I can't remember what she called it, but love how that's making that look almost like a little log cabin. So I have all four in the series to do, but I'm kind of just focusing on that first one, you know, to get that done. And then I'll move on to the other ones in the series. I have started them uh, all in the same fabric, but have not gotten very far in any of the others. Okay, then I worked on a couple of the word plays, which are Brenda Gervais patterns as well. This is August. And I when I started, I just had time stitch. The, these are all things that I started in my December crazy starts this past year. And I actually got quite a bit done on this. This went pretty quickly. So a lot of the words and then I started the sunflower stems there. So like how that came along, worked on that for some extra credit for Magical Stitches. I don't know if you guys can hear the wind. It's very windy right now, even though it's sunny. And I'm hoping that means we get some rain and it will cool down, but I'm not holding my breath. Uh, we've been on the south end of the fronts moving from west to east. So we could use the rain. Anyway, uh, July word play. And I am stitching this on a 22 count Ariosa in the colorway Buttercream. It will be a slightly larger version of this than some of the others, but that's okay. I had the fabric in my stash, so I just wanted to use it up. I'm not in love with it. It's a little too thin for my tastes, but like I said, totally fine for these small, small pieces. So, um, all the words went in, the fish went in, the stars went in, and I finished the boat. So made good progress on this. Also subbing in color and cotton floss. And I'm just using these for homework prompts or extra credit prompts, you know, wherever they fit without having any specific finish goals, plans, whatever. Then the last thing I wanted to share with you guys is an actual finish finish. This is the Drawn Threads Welcome Summer. And I converted it all to color and cotton threads. And this is on a 32 count natural linen. I think it's from r, &R. But that is done. Love this one. Love how it came out. There were tons of specialty stitches in this, which I really enjoyed doing. Um, the bee keep and the bees are some of my favorites. There's satin stitch here, and then the bees are straight stitches and satin stitches. Um, can't remember what she called these, but all of the geranium buds are little specialty stitches. And then uh, let's see if I can get that close enough. The watermelon leaf, vine leaves are specialty stitches. And was there anything else? Well, tons of back stitching. Black work, we're calling it. So I will get that one finished up so that it can go on my little 
table uh, for next summer. And that is two of the four of the welcome seasonal ones completed. I have spring and winter left to do. And my goal is to try to get those done for next over next year so I have them to put out. So that one is done. Checked off my list. Uh, two other things that I just wanted to make y'all aware of. If you are a member of the Full Coverage Fanatics group on Facebook, which I'll link to below, which I co-moderate with Kim Hollenbeck of Spartan Stitcher. Um, I believe that's where you are. Kim's Floss Tube channel is her name. Kim on Instagram is Spartan Stitcher. So we have a couple of events coming up in the Full Coverage Fanatics group. The first of which is this upcoming weekend. So it will run Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I will link to the event below, but it is a challenge to pull out your oldest full, co full coverage whip and put some stitches into it. So it can be any designer, it can be any pattern, it can be any number of stitches above one, uh, as long as it's a full coverage piece. So just trying to maybe get some traction on an older project. And I will be working on a stitching shelf, which I showed you in my whips here. Uh, since that is my oldest uh, full coverage whip. That was actually the first project I think I started after I got back into cross stitching several years ago. Uh, and Village of Hopper and Hollow is the next one that I have not yet finished. So I know I won't finish this stitching shelf this year. So be nice to finish up one of my older projects before I start some new things. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to make you guys aware of, if you are full coverage cross stitchers, is all of the 2020 challenges, the big ones for the full coverage fanatics group are up in the um, on the calendar slash events. You can look for them there. We've got a monthly challenge that's themed. And th so this is one that you do not have to count your stitches. You just post a start and stop photo. Uh, we have decided this year to do 12 countries so it's an around the world theme and we've put some suggestions in each of the months to give you guys some thought provoking moments uh, about what projects you could slot in for each of those so if you don't want to count stitches but you'd like to participate that theme challenge is great to do that we've also got a 20 in 20 so it's stitched 20,000 stitches in a single project during 2020 Obviously that's a counting event, but you know, if you're doing like a whole page, you can just get to the end of the page, kind of count up, know what your stitch count is for that. You don't have to count single individual stitches as you go. And then uh, we've also got a year long event, which is themed on the national parks. You do not have to stitch on a project that has a national park in it. You certainly can if you have one, but the point of this is it's also a counted challenge is to put 4,000 stitches into a project that matches up um, in kind of a checklist way to one of the national parks. I picked 25 of the 61 national parks here in the United States and I've listed them in alphabetical order. Now you can choose to do them by tiers, meaning each tier has five of the parks in it. So like Acadia, Arches, Badlands, I can't remember the other two, but they're in alphabetical order, and stitch 4,000 stitches for each of those parks and basically check that off on your little National Parks bingo card, which I've included in the files section. And once you finish those first five, you can try for the next five. So if you stitch all 25 National Parks that we have set up on the bingo board for 4,000 stitches each, you'll have stitched 100,000 stitches over the course of the year. Uh, it requires a fair amount of focus to do that because it's a lot of stitches per week. I think it's just under 2,000 stitches a week, it's something like 1,887, 89 stitches, something like that. Um, you can pick whatever project you want to to work on. So it doesn't matter what the theme is, you can stitch on whatever you have. But each park, you have to stitch on one project unless you finish it, in which case you can sub in a second project. 
um, 4,000 stitches into that project. So if you wanted to stitch an entire full coverage piece in one year and you know your stitch count is 100,000 stitches, you could just work on that one project through the entire event and you know that you would have it done. Or you can choose to work on one project for 4,000 stitches, a second project for 4,000 stitches, a third project, so on and so forth, and repeat that pattern as often as you want. You just have to put the 4,000 stitches into one project, go for it times 25. Uh, I, do not, I do not think realistically that that is a goal that I can reach. Um, I have a lot of other things that I wanna stitch on next year, but I am going to try to put in with my four active full coverage whips, put in those 4,000 stitches and kind of rotate my way through them. More on those kinds of plans when we get to the end of the year. Okay, so I think I've covered everything. I think I've talked long enough for today. Just looking to make sure I haven't missed anything. I think that's it. So I will leave you guys here so that I can hop off and get a few things ready to go for dinner because it's late afternoon here and my husband is out with one of his buddies um, working on their mountain bikes, but I know he will be home shortly. So uh, trying to keep that under an hour. I hope all of you are well. I hope that you are enjoying whatever season your corner of the world brings to you. I hope you're getting lots of time for crafting and some reading and just hopefully some downtime for you. And I will be back, um, I think in a couple of weeks to talk to you guys. I still am leaning towards shifting to like a weekly review because I would love these to be just a little bit shorter. And obviously I have like an hour of things to talk to you guys about. So if we could maybe make that a half hour, I think that might be a little more doable. It certainly would make upload times easier. So at any rate, um, this will get, get us caught up uh, here for the first full week of September. And I will be back to talk to y'all about whatever crazy stuff I'm working on at my end, um, either in one or two weeks. So until I talk to you next time, take care, be well.